And thank you all for joining us. We're, uh, we're hoping that uh, in the balance of our time here until about five o'clock that we can shed some additional uh, light, if not maybe even some heat, uh, pr primarily from an American perspective, but certainly informed by a close observation of the British debate. Uh, I'm uh, Stephen Flanagan, Senior Vice President here at CSIS and holder of the Kissinger Chair in International Security, and I'm delighted to be joined by a panel of uh, very seasoned and expert uh, uh, analysts of the UK defense scene and of transatlantic relations, and, I, and I, as I say, I think they will uh, provide us with some additional uh, insights into uh, how this uh, uh, UK strategic def uh, defense and security review unfolded, uh, what some of the implications are both for the special relationship and for transatlantic uh, security cooperation. Uh, it comes, uh, as General Houghton uh, noted, uh, at, a, at, a, at a critical time. Obviously, he didn't address Afghanistan. I hope we will uh, in this discussion. Uh, the, uh, the impact on Afghanistan, the fact that the UK has made that clearly a priority out to 2014, as he, as, as uh, General mentioned, uh, but, uh, but also uh, how does this mesh up with other uh, plans that are underway? We're on the eve uh, uh, later this month of a NATO summit, a summit that will also set some guidelines uh, calling uh, for uh, flexible and adaptable kinds of force capabilities that, that the UK uh, strategic defense and security review has, has called for as well, but, but how will they mesh up with other allied capabilities, particularly at a time of, uh, of scarce resources? And of course, there was a great deal of concern as to, as to how other allies would react uh, to the UK cuts, and uh, indeed the fact that they were not nearly as severe as some had initially forecast uh, led to uh, at least uh, somewhat of a sigh of relief on, on this side of the Atlantic. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, the way in which this all fits together and, and how, uh, apropos that last question, how does this relate also to bilateral cooperation among European countries, particularly the UK, French axis, uh, in sustaining uh, effective capabilities to deal with a, a wide range of, of contingencies uh, in an uncertain world. So let me, without further ado, get to our panelists. Uh, I'll introduce them, and they're uh, fortuitously lined up uh, in their, both their speaking order and, uh, and uh, in their uh, way that I'd like to introduce them. Uh, to, uh, to my immediate left is uh, uh, Mr. James Townsend. Jim is a, a long time, and you have their detailed bios in, a, in the handout uh, before you, so I won't uh, go on, but uh, Jim has uh, been a, a, a long time. Uh, he's serving currently as uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for European and NATO policy but he has uh, over 25 years of service uh, in the federal government in the Defense Department in uh, various jobs uh, dealing with European and NATO affairs. We were also have, happy to have him as a, as a colleague uh, when he served uh, just down the street from us here at, uh, at the Atlantic Council of the, of the United States as, as Vice President there, and we were collaborating with him on a number of projects. He also is informally, I guess you could say, he, I think he sees himself as uh, at least the uh, Pentagon's unofficial keeper of the special relationship, so we're very <laughs> interested to hear his his comments on, uh, on the uh, next, uh, uh, down the, the route here, uh, uh, Dr. Corey Shockey, who is uh, currently research fellow at the Hoover Institution. Uh, she lives a bicoastal existence fortuitously, both in, in Palo Alto and here in Washington occasionally when she must. Uh, she is a, a former colleague uh, at the National Defense University, but also has a, a great deal of experience in foreign and defense policy uh, and defense planning, uh, both at the Joint Staff and the National Security Council. Uh, and she also served uh, as, uh, as an advisor, as, as you'll note in her bio, uh, to the uh, McCain-Palin presidential campaign as uh, senior defense advisor uh, in 2008. Uh, next, David Berteau, who is uh, our director here at CSIS of our uh, Defense Industrial Initiatives Group. David has a, has a long career uh, in, in a variety of, of, of the uh, Pentagon and, and, uh, and governmental appointments, as well as in the private sector. He's also been affiliated uh, uh, with the, uh, international, uh, the uh, uh, international Security Studies Program at the Maxwell School at Syracuse. Uh, and he has just released, as some of you may know and have seen, uh, we'll have an event, just a little bit of brief advertising, uh, an event uh, later this week on Friday. Uh, to discuss a new report that he and his team have just released on 10-year uh, trends in European defense spending, and I'm sure he's going to touch on a little bit of that uh, today as it relates to the UK. And uh, last but certainly not least, uh, Mr. Nate Fryer. Uh, uh, he, uh, before he put on that suit, he uh, had a 25-year career, 25 career in the U.S. Army. He's a senior fellow now with us in the International Security uh, program uh, at CSIS, but also uh, dual-hatted as a fellow at the Army uh, War College, so he also lives a bit of a, 
not quite a bicoastal existence, but he shuttles back and forth between Carlisle and here. Uh, and he is, in a sense, uh, somewhat of our, uh, uh, well, if Jim is the custodian of the special relationship, uh, Nate having served very closely uh, during his military career, both as a strategist and in a variety of operational assignments, uh, he also served for two years uh, with the UK Armed Forces, so uh, with the British Army, so he has a, I think he feels he has a special, a special affection and, and, uh, and relationship himself with the British uh, Armed Forces, so he, uh, well, we, uh, we'll, uh, we'll have him uh, address some of that. So. Let me turn the floor over uh, to uh, Jim Townsend. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Steve. Uh, and also, uh, thanks to John Hamry, who I think might still be here, for uh, putting CSIS on the case in terms of taking a look at uh, what the UK uh, accomplished with its review and uh, what this means for all of us and what it means for the next 10 years. I, I think it's a... a uh, very timely, and it's something that I've been working on uh, oh, for months um, as the UK began to come to grips with uh, the financial situation that it has and that a number of nations have across the alliance in terms of deficits and, uh, and economies that need to be strengthened and governments that are trying to work out how do they go about spending the tax monies they have in a way that will help their economy uh, while also keeping intact other things such as defense. And, um, and what I was asked to talk about a little bit today, uh, it, which is how the U.S. Uh, worked with the U.K. on this, and which I will, uh, and also I'll make a couple other points that I'm going to pass off to Corey who will set you all straight on what really happened. Um, but um, first, as the General said, uh, we've, we've worked with the U.K. for a number of years uh, in terms of planning. Uh, we've, uh, the U.S. has had planners do rotations through the U.K. planning establishment and um, the U.K. Uh, similarly with us as we go about doing our QDR. And so there's a, an exchange of, of um, information on how we go about these, uh, these analytical products which are very difficult to do. Uh, there's a real science to it. I, I know you all know that. Uh, but it's something that we collaborate on and have for a long time. And it's not just with the UK either. There are other nations we have consultations with and we try to uh, take advantage of all the brain power out there in the planning community as we try to look out um, the years that we've got to be planning for and, and ready for. And that certainly uh, takes as, many, uh, as much brain power as we can pull together from across the alliance. Um, with the UK, what's different is that um, up until now, they have not had a, a review on a, on a uh, sustained basis, on a routine basis, something that was consistent. This is something new. It, it seemed to me, and I might be wrong, but it seemed to me that uh, they had a review whenever they felt it was time for one, uh, which is uh, interesting in, in, in how they go about determining when that is. Uh, but obviously, given the strategic situation where we are now, uh, post 9-11, uh, new strategic concept at, at NATO, uh, new threats that we're trying to uh, be ready for. I think the UK felt it was time, uh, new government there, but, uh, but particularly it was the budget drill that made this, uh, made it something that had to be approached on an aggressive basis, and one where uh, very quickly uh, we began to, uh, to, to uh, receive briefings and, and hear uh, some of the early thinking about where the UK felt it needed to go. Um, I took a few trips to London myself uh, and uh, sat there and, and tried to help think through what it was that made sense for our two countries in terms of our future collaboration. Uh, what did we, uh, what, what, what did we, what would we hope that the UK could bring to the table five to ten years out? And in an alliance context, what would we hope that the UK would bring uh, to the Allies when it was a, uh, when it was a, um, a NATO operation that had, that had to kick off? And, uh, Given these, given on the one hand this uh, this attempt to figure out what it was that uh, that the UK needed to bring to the table, while on the other hand, dealing with the amount of money that was going to be available, it was a it was a some very stark choices uh, <clears throat> became very apparent, and I think we all quickly realized that um, that we were at a at a point, and certainly in British uh, defense and military history, where it was very different than the 1998 uh, review. I think there was another one in 2004, where there were uh, reviews, but not one that had the kind of decisions that this one had to make. Uh, and so uh, we had a um, we had to do a lot of thinking on the U.S. side. 
Uh, we don't necessarily always think in terms of, of, of other nations when we do the QDR. We, we, do, we, we, we do some of that, but this time we had to really put our analytical uh, brain power to work within the Pentagon and come up with something that, some advice and, and, and that type of thing that would be uh, value added to what the UK was, was indeed struggling with. And so, and so we did. But I will say it was a cliffhanger for us too. Uh, as the days approached when the uh, review was to be laid out, uh, and, uh, and I had seen, as I said, some of the early uh, ideas about where the UK was going, and they were, they were uh, real, uh, <laughs> um, uh, some pretty draconian directions that I'm glad were not taken uh, as, as the UK dealt with uh, the reality. And so they came up with a, a package that was finally released that you heard about from the general that I, that I feel, having worked this, uh, put them in a pretty good place given what they had to deal with in terms of the finance and given what they had to deal with uh, in terms of uh, future threats. And I'm just going to give you a couple of points that I'm going to continue to, uh, to, to watch and to work on and then I'm going to pass it to Corey and then I'm sure we'll, we'll have lots of questions. But the first of all, the first point uh, is that the, as the general said, this is the beginning and not an end. And that, to me, is a key point. As a defense planner myself out at NATO, trying to look out 10 years, um, you know that you're always having to go through and adapt and reshape your thinking based on uh, events, based on the unexpected and surprise. And the fact that there's going to be another review in 2015 is important so that uh, we can, so that the UK can gauge uh, the unintended consequences of decisions just made. If this was going to be a, a one-time decision and then off they went until it was felt it was time for another defense review, uh, that would have, I think, put, it, put the UK and our, and our relationship on an on a, uh, unstable footing. And so the fact that it's going to be one where other reviews uh, are coming is, is, has given us all confidence that we can move ahead and make changes as we need to. The fact that adaptability was put into their uh, planning was key uh, for me as well. Again, as we know from defense planning, as we know from history, uh, we have to adapt and sometimes very quickly. And there was some fear that the changes that the UK was, uh, was going to make were going to keep, was, was going to be pretty much locked in stone. Uh, some of them are going to be far-reaching, some of these decisions, but uh, the, the ability to adapt to new situations, if in 2015 there's a feeling there's got to be changes made, I, I'm, I'm glad that that has been uh, maintained. Um, there was a quick uh, reference to regeneration, and that, was, that has been repeated a couple times. That regeneration aspect is also crucial for me, but I will, I will tell you, uh, I think we all talk about regenerating things, uh, putting things into cold storage and uh, waiting for better times to come. And when those better times come, things don't necessarily regenerate the way you wanted them to. And so we'll all be watching that regeneration process. Uh, he mentioned that armor and artillery was going to be part of this regeneration process. And um, uh, he mentioned that uh, armor and artillery are less relevant today. I feel armor and artillery is always relevant. Uh, the more, the better. I realize that's probably a little bit of old thinking there, but uh, I do hope that uh, in terms of regeneration of, of skill sets such as those, I hope that, in fact, it will come sooner rather than later. And then my final point, and then over to Corey, is that um, you know, we have worked with the UK for many years. Myself, I feel I'm a bit of a force generator uh, because in so many times, whether it was Desert Storm or it was Somalia, the Balkan Wars, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, because we do European policy in the Pentagon, we're the ones that have to gather together the European participation, uh, both at NATO as well as uh, on, a, on a coalition basis. And, the, the, and what we always find is that there's a never, never enough UK forces. UK forces, uh, as you don't have to be told, are some of the best in the world. Uh, and we've had a long history of working with them. Uh, and when we're in the thick of things, we always need more rather than less. And so my concern, and what I will be watching closely, as all of us will, is the, um, the ability for the UK forces to, to uh, be capable of sustainment and dealing with concurrent operations, where UK forces could be strung out doing two or three other things, uh, and a big requirement comes up, uh, and we find that they're stretched too thin. Uh, or there's been some hollowing out. No one wants that. No one wants to find themselves stretched too thin. No one wants to find readiness 
uh, numbers impacted because of the, an ops tempo problem. So I hope as the UK forces get smaller and as we all work together um, in, 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 in uh, dealing with uh, force reshaping and reductions, that we can keep this uh, sustainment and concurrent operations issue uh, at bay and keep our eye on that because, as I said, the call is always there's never enough UK forces and now they're going to get smaller and, that, and that's what concerns me. Final point, Corey, and then over to you is um, you know, it's not just the UK that's doing it. The US is, is also downsizing, so are other European allies. Um, what we are, what we've got to do is try to do this in a coordinated fashion at NATO. My big concern is that uh, in terms of transatlantic uh, capabilities, we've got to uh, manage these drawdowns and these reshapings, whether it's the German forces or French, in such a way that we don't hollow ourselves out as a transatlantic uh, uh, capability Five, ten years down the road, we wake up, we need to have the, uh, a good force structure, and we find that we haven't coordinated them to uh, such a degree that we have the forces that, that we're going to need uh, ten years out. And so I hope uh, that the Alliance over the next six to eight months will take up a review to see where these, uh, uh, where these reforms will take us. So, Corey, over to you. So, oh, okay. uh, so I want to make three points. The first about the political and economic context in which the British Defense Review took place. The second, to grade it on strict defense policy. And then third, to raise a couple of concerns that I have about it going into the future. Um, first, the context. Um, it's hard to actually capture the breathtaking magnitude of what the British government has undertaken uh, because we haven't tried anything like this uh, either in magnitude or seriousness in a really long time. 20% cuts to every government department except for health care. Uh, er the original target was 25% cuts. Imagine a quarter of government spending going away at a time when the government's worried about the jobs, not just the 25,000 folks being bounced out of the defense ministry, but overall, um, that they have taken this much near-term risk in order to buy themselves a stronger strategic situation, I think is extraordinarily commendable. It's fantastic. Britain will be a better ally to the United States in 2015 from getting their house in order. And as a taxpayer, I really wish our government would work on this magnitude as well. This is, they made a difficult set of choices and they made them well. They uh, cut spending to, in order to afford the, the reductions in government spending. A third, they took a, a thirds at it. So a third of the increase will in government revenue will come from taxes, two-thirds of the decrease, so how you get to where they are, a third increase in taxes, a two-thirds decrease in government spending. That strikes me as a proportion that is sellable in even other countries, in fact, perhaps even the dusty little cow town in Northern California that I hail from. The second thing that they did that I think is extraordinarily commendable is that defense wasn't just treated like another government department. And I think that's not only appropriate given the security threats they face, but also given that they're fighting two wars. Um, and so defense took an 8% cut. Other departments ended up taking closer to 20%. That too strikes me as a reasonable and politically saleable proportion. Because to suggest to people that their uh, retirement age will be increased and their uh, waiting lines at the DMV are going to be higher, but defense will remain untouched, especially in the American case where defense spending has more than doubled in the course of the last nine years. I think that's a difficult proposition to pull off as a, as a political high wire act. Um, so I think in the broader context where they accepted near-term risk in order to strengthen their strategic circumstances, where they put tax cut, tax increases and spending cuts in a one-third to two-thirds ratio, and where they put defense at roughly 8% reductions when other departments are at roughly 20%. Those all feel um, roughly right to me, and, and I'd be proud if my government would do such a thing. Uh, second point, as defense policy. 
This strikes me that they made a very difficult set of choices very well uh, because they didn't uh, cut their commitment to the wars that we're fighting. Second, the proportion of reductions in personnel that they took, 5,000 apiece for the Army and the Air Force, um, the, excuse me, for the Navy and the Air Force, the Army's reductions pushed uh, more into the future because of the current demands on the Army. Again, that sounds to me sensible. They maintained their nuclear deterrent. They maintained continuous at sea presence of their submarines and the deterrent. They accepted, they maintained the two carriers, although that was, as I understand, under grievance um, and that the, the Chancellor of the Exchequer would have liked to have gone after them in a more serious way if the contracts for them had been uh, more nimble or more fungible. Uh, third, the other things that they did, they increased spending on special forces, they increased spending and effort on cyber. Um, they made a sense of a set of choices that, uh, that shield to a much greater degree the things that make the British military most valuable to us, most capable of fighting alongside us at the highest level of intensity of operations. That's a terrific set of choices that I think we ought to, ought to commend. Um, there are clearly things we wish um, they hadn't done. I'm sure there are clearly things they wish they hadn't done. But they were operating in a very tight fiscal environment. Um, looks to me like the biggest gap is the now to 2019 uh, carrier fighter gap, which lots of ways you could fix it. You could uh, rush unmanned aviation in there. You could uh, partner with the French or other, I mean, lots of creative ways you could do it. None of those things are actually funded in this budget. So if they want to overcome that near-term gap, they're going to have to spend some money for it. Um, third point, the concerns that I have, uh, one would be that uh, Prime Minister Cameron has, has sort of winked and nodded that defense spending will go up again in 2015. Uh, if I were the defense ministry, I'd spend a lot of time trying to get clarification in public on the record from <laughs> that, because I'd be surprised given, given how difficult the choices they are having to make in non-defense spending, uh, whether in 2015 defense spending is going to go up. Second, uh, continuous at sea presence of the nuclear deterrent. Uh, I don't want to be uh, too too much in the nuclear priesthood here, but it does seem to me that the difficulties attendant on shifting from continuous at sea to part-time at sea can be enormously destabilizing in crisis. And I, I would encourage our British friends and colleagues not to rush to something uh, to reduce present, uh, to reduce the continuous at sea presence, which will make near-term fiscal sense but won't make strategic sense. Uh, another concern I have looking across as a green eye shade comptroller type is that it does seem to me that the creeping underfunding that, they, that the Cameron government is justifiably upset about having unearthed in the defense budget is likely to creep right back in there. Um, that's a tendency in all defense budgets uh, as no less a source than John Hamry could tell us, the program of record very often is underfunded. Given the kinds of cuts that non-defense spending is being expected, are being expected, is, are? I lost track of my sentence. That uh, are being taken, it seems to me that, uh, that uh, the Cameron government will likely punish and should punish any creeping underfunding that comes back into the defense program, especially on such a short time frame. To conclude, uh, <laughs> the last thing I would say is that in the British defense strategic defense review, and I agree with Jim's judgment that this is a budget review, it's not really a strategic review, although they made good strategic choices, it looks to me. Um, that uh, the British have the luxury of being able to have us pick up any slack for what needs doing. We actually don't have that luxury with anybody else in the international order, 
And as, as comforting and helpful as NATO allies are, uh, it is often tempting to wish we could get a better brand of allies to trade them in for. There's not a better brand of allies on the horizon, it doesn't look like to me. Um, and so we, I agree with Jim's closing caution that we ought to be extremely careful that as allies do, do defense reviews that result in budget cuts, that it doesn't accrue a larger and larger set of expectations of what the United States will do. Thank you, Corey. David? Thank you, Steve. I want to provide a couple of brief comments about the impact of the SDSR on defense industry, both in Britain and perhaps across Europe and even in the U.S., and also provide a little bit of context about the broader European uh, situation. Uh, and as Steve mentioned, we are, uh, we are releasing and, uh, and have a rollout event on Friday morning in CSIS of our European defense spending, our defense trends uh, report, and you'll have more detail on it then. First, on the impact on industry. On hardware, uh, clearly there are reductions in funding and reductions in programs, cancellations, et cetera. Uh, there is the potential for some recovery in a couple of areas. I think one of the grave challenges that you face in any European country, and the, the British have not been exempt from this, is the tendency when funds go down to become nationalistic in the, in the focus and to only buy uh, from domestic producers, and, uh, regardless of whether or not uh, that's competitively priced or, uh, or provides the kind of capability that's necessary. Uh, and we'll have, to, we'll have to see whether or not that's, in fact, what develops inside, uh, inside the United Kingdom. Uh, there's also, I think, an emphasis much stronger on reliance on legacy systems, and that will provide an opportunity uh, for more sustainment. This is not addressed uh, clearly in, the, uh, in either the SDSR or in the budget, uh, but the potential is clearly there for an increased reliability on sustainment. The U.S., by the way, will soon face a similar choice. On the services side, which of course is a, uh, in the U.S. is about half of defense spending, in the U.K. it's uh, nearly the same. Um, the cuts to civilians that are uh, laid out, while we don't have the year-by-year -year reductions, and it's 25,000 off of a base of, uh, of uh, under 100,000, so it's really significant, nearly a third cut. Um, really, unless activities themselves are eliminated, we will see this lead to exactly the same thing that we've seen elsewhere, which is an increase of reliance on contractors. Um, because uh, if the work has to be done, and you get rid of the people who are doing it, but you don't get rid of the work, then there will be another way found to do it, and that typically is reliance on contractors. So while there may be opportunities here for individual companies, I think there's a pitfall for the overall uh, strategic intent of the review, uh, unless that's addressed. And that since the timing's uncertain, it's a little bit difficult to, uh, to conceive of the outcome there. There's a focus and an emphasis on more reliability on commercial items, commercial off the shelf, and on exports to sustain the industry. Um, this is a, a familiar tune. We've heard this over and over again. It requires one of two things, or actually both of two things. One is a lot better commercial stuff or a reduced capability. Uh, the second is, in fact, a change in export control regimes because while the British may want to export more, uh, all of their material will be subject to U.S. ITAR considerations, and, uh, and we've been watching the progress of that or the lack thereof over the last couple of years in the U.S. Um, I think there is still some hope for progress in the future, um, but if the, uh, if the British system will depend upon U.S. progress on export control reforms, uh, they've put themselves in our pocket in a way in which we don't necessarily uh, benefit. There's a broader context, though, that I think is worth looking at here, and, and let me give you a, a couple of just sort of general European trends and how the British fit into that category. Over the last decade, defense spending across Europe has been down almost 2 percent per year. Uh, the British have held pretty firm in that context, and so they've been kind of one of the, the outliers in terms of that overall trend. Um, but in, inside that trend are a couple of very interesting counterpoints. One is that the actual reduction in forces has exceeded the reduction in spending, so that across Europe, spending per soldier has actually gone up. And uh, even within the UK, where you haven't had significant reductions, it's been held steady. This actually has some significant potential implications for capability of the remaining force, regardless of the ultimate size. And I think it's a very positive trend and one that uh, the U.S. should continue to encourage, notwithstanding the fact that I don't have any indication we actually even are aware of it, uh, which makes it difficult to encourage. Uh, also, within that reduction, contrary to the U.S. experience, the investment accounts have been largely protected. 
while overall spending is down 1.8%, investment spending is down on an annual rate of less than half of that. And that's typically not the case uh, here in the U.S. where we protect personnel accounts and infrastructure accounts and we reduce uh, R&D and procurement. Uh, the European trend has been in the opposite direction. Whether this can continue into the second decade of the 21st century remains to be seen. Then finally, with respect to industry, uh, we actually created a, an index to track European uh, uh, security, uh, defense, and space firms. And we've been tracking their performance over the last decade as well. And while spending is down nearly 2%, the revenue of these firms is up on an annual average rate of 5%. So it's pretty clear they've already done what the British say they're going to do, which is they've relied on growth in exports. And much of that export growth has been to the US. Um, so, you know, as long as our budget was doubling, it made it easy for European defense industry to continue to grow. Now that our budget's going to go down, that may be create an additional uh, circumstance that will be uh, hard to follow. Finally, let me close with an anecdote about regeneration, because I like Jim's comment about how difficult it is to do. I had the privilege nearly two dec decades ago to chair the Defense Conversion Commission, which was looking at uh, what we were going to do after the end of the Cold War and how we were going to spend the peace dividend to keep industry alive and help them figure out what to build since they weren't going to build tanks and ships and planes anymore. Um, one of the things that we ran across was the incredible angst with which the Army approached the ending of the cavalry. And I'm not talking about the cavalry regiments we have today. I'm talking about man of horseback soldiers. Um, now, there are a few Army guys in the audience here. I know some of you, and, I, and, I, and you all know how hard it is for the Army to let go of its past. Uh, and the Army looked forward with great, great anxiety towards eliminating horseback riders. And among the concerns documented at the time, and this is the 1930s, so this is not all that long ago, was a grave concern that if the situation ever warranted reconstitution of the cavalry, we might not have the saddle and bridle harness industry uh, capability to, uh, to be able to sustain that, that regeneration of the cavalry. And so there was actual physical evidence of analysis of whether we should act to preserve the saddle and bridle industry in America in order to allow the reconstitution of the cavalry. Now, I'm happy to report that no government funds were expended on that, on that uh, point. And at the time we looked at it, the latest data showed that the domestic commercial saddle and bridle industry in the US was four times larger in 1989 than it had been in 1937. And so we actually had the ability to reconstitute the cavalry should we have wanted to if that ever came <laughs> about. We still have that capability today. So um, there is always hope, Jim. So with that, let me turn it over to Nate. Thanks. Thanks. We didn't know the Northern Alliance would help fill some of the gap, but yeah. go ahead, <laughs> Nate. Precisely. Um, I, I'm not going to, I don't want to belabor points that are already made, so let me just make a couple of uh, quick observations um, and, then, and then move it on to questions and, and answers. Um, as, as Steve alluded to, as a mid-career officer some 12 years ago, I was fortunate enough to, to be seconded to the British Army um, in, in the north of England for two and a half years. And what that experience allowed me to gain was I, I gained an appreciation for the British, much like the American military has this, you know, has this the reputation for kind of a can-do attitude. But the, but the British military, it was always can-do with less resources, right? I mean, it, it really was. I mean, they literally were doing things with far fewer resources than we ever had at, at the time. And, and there's something to be said for that. And, and actually, I mean, what I see in this review, quite frankly, is the British sort of reaffirming the can-do attitude. They're, they're saying, look, we're con going to continue to to fulfill our responsibilities around the world. It's just we, are, we have to take some very difficult, um, you know, fiscal decisions in particular that are going to require us to, to basically stand down some capability. And in certain cases, in order to sort of do a down payment for capability in the future, which I think, uh, I do think that is actually a wise um, choice on their part. I mean, let me, let me just say a couple things first about the review in general. I mean, I, I, like Corey, would like to actually say that it is, there, there's some laudable aspects to, to this review in that, unlike in the United States, we tend to actually say, look, we need to take whole of government approaches to things. We need to, we need to see, you know, security problems in a much more civil military context as opposed to a military and civilian context separately. The British seem to have taken that a step further, actually, in their national security strategy and their SDSR, and they've actually incorporated the two and said, look, we're going to look at you know, our security problems in a more holistic civil military context. And within that context, there are things best performed um, 
uh, with a civilian lead and those things that are best performed with the military lead, and to the extent possible, we're going to attempt to, 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 to fill those gaps with those more appropriate um, agencies. Um, and it, we, we put out a critical question before General Houghton's um, uh, speech a, a couple of weeks ago. And, and a similar point came up in the green room when we were discussing, look, my sense is, is the British Armed Forces are sort of the lead recon element in a discussion that we're going to go through very soon. Um, uh, that we are going to have to make some difficult strategic choices uh, with respect to our own uh, military spending. I think Corey alluded to that as well, that, you know, spending has doubled in the last decade for obvious reasons, but there's going to be a, a period where that's not going to be um, that that spending is going to be difficult to justify, at, at least at the levels it's at, and therefore we're going to have to decide, uh, much like I think the British are deciding, and I'll make a couple points on this, what is it we are going to do and what is it we are going to refrain from doing commonly, um, and how are we going to actually um, sort of restrain ourselves from, in fact, making the mistake of overcommitment and overstretch. Um, I found it really ironic, actually. When I was... Um, when I was actually seconded to the British Army at the time, the Army was not much smaller than it is right now, 103,000, I think, at the time. And at the time, uh, the American military was, was really complaining about the eight, seven or eight percent it had deployed at any one given time in the Balkans and other commitments around the world, and talking about how it was removing our fighting edge. And at the same time, the British had up to like 40 percent of their military deployed around the world on operations in Northern Ireland and the Balkans. Et cetera. So, I mean, you, you just, you really do gain a, a new appreciation for, you know, the benefit of having a lot of stuff. Um, so, let me just talk about three, I think it's three real quick points. First, let me just give the British government plaudits on their risk construct. We have struggled with the idea of articulating risk in a document like this for years. Uh, we've never actually articulated it in a way that, that was honest and made sense. And I think actually the British, with their three-tier risk construct, identifying sort of 15 key risks, I think is the number, um, in three tiers, is, is a step forward. Is it perfect? No. I actually have some, I would have some very serious questions about some of the things they've included in tier one versus tier two and things like that, but that's, that, that, that doesn't matter. What matters is actually they've made a, a sort of a public statement of risk and where, where their principal risk lies. So that's a, a very big plus. The second I'd say is they've articulated a force sizing construct that's that, that whether they adhere to it or not is a completely different point. I think General Houghton made that, that point that, you know, policy is not actually execution. But, I mean, we have struggled for some time to actually articulate a force sizing construct inside our own Department of Defense that makes sense. I mean, in the British SDSR, they've basically said, you know, we can do, a, a, I have it here somewhere, you know, we can do one of these and two of these, or we can do three of these, or we can do one big of these, right? And, and, and that makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, when you're dealing, when you have to make strategy on finite resources, you have to be able to articulate what it is the force is capable of, of doing, and to actually make that statement, I thought was a, a, a big plus as well. Now, let me just conclude on two points. First, the regeneration point. I want to echo everything that's being said here. Regeneration, especially when you're talking about the competencies that are required um, to, to fight an AS-90 battalion or a Challenger battalion in the British Army is very difficult, and the technical hurdles of overcoming that are difficult. So I think that I would caution, that's a caution I would um, lay out. And then finally, what I would say, though, is get, again, getting back to this discussion that we're going to ultimately have to have in the United States, I think what's very, the most interesting and unrecognized piece of the document, in my mind, was this, this restatement of a new realism uh, that's contained in it, which basically says it's really almost like an articulation of a Powell or Weinberger doctrine um, from, a, from, a, from a British perspective. And it basically says we're gonna, we are going to take actions in the future that are interest-based, that we're going to get the most bang for the buck from strategically. That it's basically what I think it is, is it's a, it's a statement of recognizing that we can do a lot of things but we're going to choose to not do as much as potentially we've done in the past. And I, and I don't think that's a, that's not a, that is not a uh, retraction of any global influence. What that is is a recognition of a reality, again, that we're probably going to have to um, face up to as well in the future. And with that, I'll open it to questions. Great. Thank you very much, Nate. Thanks. And uh, we're happy to now take some, we have about 15, maybe 20 minutes or so for questions and, and dialogue with the audience. So I look forward to it. Uh, Harlan Allman, I see you in the first. You just identify yourself and wait for a microphone. And then Keith Dunn. Uh, I'm Harlan Ullman. Thank you for your comments. And Corey and Nate, I agree with you entirely. I think that this document that the British have come up with 
uh, also has the values of being apolitical and nonpartisan, which seem to elude us in this country. My question is this. Uh, the British have come up with an interesting statement, but now they're in the process of implementation. And General Sir David Richards, the new Chief of Defense Staff, has given roughly 60 days to come up with how they're going to actually make this work. It seems to me central to making this work is how do you include innovation, imagination, and creativity, which are very much, very much unmentioned. Now, as many of you may or may not know, there are six studies that have not been released yet that underpin the SDSR that have to do with regeneration, the multi-combat brigades, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Because those brigades are still undefined, how they're going to use their naval forces, whether they're going to be able to bring in French or US naval assets. These are things that are still very much works in progress. It seems to me this is a terrific opportunity if we, having just disestablished Joint Forces Command and the need for experimentation, are interested in innovation, creativity, and imagination. How then do we team with the British so that their defense review and what they're doing can become a test bed for a lot of things that have to be done in an alliance context and certainly within the context of the uh, strategic relationship. For example, Corey was very concerned about part-time at sea deterrence. Uh, you can fire a D5 from a London bus, actually. So this may give one an opportunity for looking at new ways of doing deterrence. But my question is, can we use this as an opportunity for innovation, imagination, um, and how do we go about doing that? Okay. Let me, let's hold that and let's take a couple more questions and then let the panel respond. Keith Dunn, right here in the third row there, ma'am. I'm sorry. Keith Dunn, this is really a specific one for Jim, and it's given what we heard about the review, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that you're playing or have played a major role in the command structure review that will be announced at the NATO summit and the international staff review that's been played out. What impact did the, what you knew was going on in the UK have in those discussions? I rule that, you want me to rule that question out of order, or? <laughs> 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 and I, when you called on Keith, I knew it was a Okay, car. sorry. I can't see, in the, any other questions quickly, or? Well, let me, oh, let's go ahead. Uh, well, you want to get the specific one, and then go to the general one? I'll start with you, Jim. Thank you. <laughs> go ahead. Give me all those mics. Uh, well, first, let me start with, with, with Harlan uh, quickly. And I think Harlan, Steve handed me this two minutes, please, note, right when I was getting ready to say exactly that your point. And, uh, and that is that um, this is a time for uh, really trying to get creative and figure out how we can do things smarter. And, and I uh, can't tell you how this is uh, something within the alliance context we're going to have to grasp and do. I'll give you an example. Julian Lindley French, our friend uh, from the UK, uh, had an editorial talking about maritime patrol aircraft. And he was pointing out that why don't, why don't the UK and the French and the US should maybe go about you know, some, I can't remember exactly his, his, his suggestion, but why can't we go about somehow um, having that as a joint capability that we all, uh, they all practice? Now, the UK has canceled the maritime aircraft, which is a, a pity. The requirement, I think, is still there, but that was part of the hard decisions that they had. But maybe we can come up with a way of operating where we can still maintain maritime patrol aircraft if we operate together. Uh, the UK and the French are going to announce some, uh, I hope, very creative ideas coming up. But I, but I keep stressing in the alliance context, this is how we're going to have to go as well. And this gets to where Keith is. Um, you know, uh, it wasn't just in London uh, where these economic pressures caused decisions to be made uh, that we never thought we'd see made in our lifetime. Another place is at, in NATO, uh, where we have gone through over the past year probably one of the most ambitious reform agendas that I never thought I'd see in my lifetime, but, but we did it because we had no choice in terms of the common funds that the Alliance uh, needed to have for Afghanistan, the funding crises that we had in various uh, European and capitals, and certainly our own concerns about funding here in Washington. So uh, part of that led us to developing a new command structure, which is smaller uh, than, than, uh, than what we currently have now, and more fit for purpose, as they say. Uh, and I think uh, the alliance, particularly the military side uh, and the political side, frankly, can be very proud of the analysis that went into that. And part of the Lisbon summit will be 
agreeing on a new uh, blueprint, and then uh, after Lisbon, we'll be uh, putting together the geography of it and, and this type of thing. But the point here is that whether it's a reform with uh, NATO agencies, whether it is the NATO command structure, um, th there's nothing like a financial crisis to really make you analyze what you're doing and try to figure out can you do it more, more efficiently and more affordably. Uh, while keeping your quality and your capability higher. Well, I think we were able to do that with the NATO command structure, and, um, and I think uh, that kind of thinking wasn't around the table as we were doing that, Keith. It wasn't just the UK uh, ha uh, having in their own capital wrestling with the same type of thing, but in Germany as well, in Paris, Washington, all around. So we came to that table with this idea that whether it was at home or whether it was going to be at, with NATO and with NATO institutions, we were going to have to be more creative, have to be more affordable, uh, and more efficient while keeping the quality up. Great. Corey, did you want to address Harlan's question? on, And maybe if I could add one other thing. What about coherence, overall force coherence, as we look at innovation and other things? I am, um, I like Harnell and am a big fan of innovation. I think it's the fundamental American advantage in everything. And that if the American way of war is um, adaptive, it's because we very often don't have it right. We get it right. Um, and so creating a system that's open and malleable to building a better mousetrap is our traditional advantage and one we ought to celebrate and encourage. Where I think we might disagree, Harlan, is that it looks to me like that attitude is actually thriving in the American military now, and the driver of it has actually not been GIFCOM, it's been the wars that we're fighting. Mm -hmm. It's been smart sergeants trying to keep soldiers from getting killed, and that has perked upward as much as innovation in grand concepts has perked downward. Um, it does seem to me that uh, the most important document GIFCOM ever published was last spring's joint operating environment which said that the largest threat to the United States is the debt we are accumulating because it will crowd out sensible military spending in a very short period of time. So I'm grateful to GIFCOM for that and much else, but I don't think they are essential to the kind of innovation that's going on. I think the wars have actually concentrated um, innovation in a service and a joint context. GIFCOM can contribute to that, but in my judgment, they're not the fundamental drivers. Um, the last thing I would say is uh, your innovative uh, basing concept for the D5. Uh, I think merits some consideration. It's bringing to mind the Carter administration's deceptive mobile basing, but I'm teensy bit skeptical whether the Cameron government is actually going to get public support in Parliament for bus-based it's kind of a hybrid warfare thing, like all you civilians can protect our nuclear deterrent. I'm not sure it's gone very far, though. Nate, uh, would yeah, you like to I just, address I just this? want to make a quick point on, on innovation. I think that the, the um, here's the big innovation that's going to occur, in my mind, right now, between, and I think the British and the Americans are both going to go through this. And that innovation is, um, and I think General Halton spoke to this as well, there is obviously a degree of caution about intervention that is going to come from the past decade's experience. The cost of intervention, uh, the, the, the price of the length, the duration, et cetera. And I think what's going to, import, going to be important for both, uh, both of our countries is actually looking at a new, in some respects, a new American, a new American or joint or combined way of war that foresees interventions that are less resource or time intensive but that are focused on achieving a more limited and circumspect set of objectives in very complex environments. And there, I think we all have to get our heads together. Because frankly, I think that the, the defense or military or popular market will not bear anything other than that right now, given what we've invested over the years. Thanks. Just some other quick, I thought I saw another hand. Yes. It's uh, two in the back row. Hi, uh, Pete Nanos. Uh, Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. Uh, Harlan, is a, as a former director of the Navy Strategic Program that produced uh, many Trident missiles under the, uh, the uh, special relationship and the Plyer Sales Agreement, I don't think a bus would quite handle a D5, but that's, it's close. It's but on the other hand, it, you may paint it to look like a bus, but believe me, it won't be a bus. 
Uh, the, but I'd like to talk a little bit about the Polaris sales agreement because there is a bit of innovation in that that I don't think people really un, uh, recognize, and that is that the UK has saved billions of pounds over the years because of the special relationship within that program. That in fact, the US has borne the development costs for the most part of the D5, and the UK has just bought, uh, borne the recurring costs because of the merged nature of the missile production and missile storage, and they uh, don't have to pay the test requirements and everything else. So there, uh, there is a degree of cooperation with that program, and, and it's also clearly because the increased uh, uh, production capability has saved U.S. dollars also. And I was wondering if there was any inkling that perhaps in the future there would be some more development programs on that model that might, uh, might save and help them stretch their dollars further and get to more uh, compatible and, uh, and interoperable capability. Okay, thank you. Could you just pass the microphone to the woman uh, just two rows in front of you there, Heather Conley from CSI? We should roll this question out of bounds. It's going to be around. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, hi, Heather Conley from CSIS. Uh, this is for Jim, but I'd love comments uh, for, for the rest of the panel. Um, it was your cliffhanger comment, Jim. Um, I was in London when Secretary Clinton made her comments, uh, widely publicized right before the SDSR was, was released about, we need a more capable ally, we're, we're concerned about these cuts. How much do you think, what role played uh, in both Secretary Gates and Secretary Clinton's uh, both public interventions, the interventions I'm sure that were ha happening behind the scenes and going from what was rumored to be a 20% reduction to an 8%. And you know, I'm just thinking reverse-wise, if it's true that implicitly in the SDSR, it's, you know, we're making reductions, but with the built-in assumption uh, across many European st strategic reviews that the U.S. will pick up where we're cutting back. I'm just trying to think sort of the reverse engineer of, of that. Um, when we start making difficult choices and cuts, are we going to hear from Liam Fox and uh, Cameron and others going, oh, oh, wait a minute, guys, you can't cut because you're part of my strategy. So just wondering if I can have your comment on that. Okay. Let me, let me tackle uh, Pete's question first about the potential for further collaboration uh, at the programmatic and perhaps broader level. If you go back to the QDR from last year, it has a very strong emphasis on building partnership capacity. And, uh, and if you look at the actualization of that emphasis over the last year and a half or so, it's primarily been focused on the slowest wagons in the wagon train, not on those who are closest to the pace that we can uh, mm -hmm. uh, capture here. Uh, I used to be a teacher, and this is akin to teaching to the lowest student in your class, which will guarantee that he or she gets better, but all the rest of them fall further behind. And I think we have a very strong national interest in, in fact, going to the opposite end of that spectrum, and that is focusing a whole lot on, uh, on cooperation and collaboration and building partnership capacity with our greatest allies rather than those that happen to be the most demanding of the situation at the moment. Um, in order to do that, though, we're going to have to have more than a program-by-program program look at, the, at that opportunity, and I think that's going to require a substantial change in the way DOD thinks about it today. So I'm not personally optimistic, Pete, about the potential for that. I think the reality is quite clearly there. If you look at a situation in which Europe is spending more per soldier but less overall, clearly that's going to take you in one of two directions. You're either going to have a hell of a lot less capability or you're going to focus that capability on fewer people and have more of it on a per soldier basis. Europe needs to make that choice. They're not going to make that choice without us helping them, and I don't see the U.S. stepping up to that quite yet. I'll just take a, a quick pass at Heather's question. It does seem to me that the Obama administration is unlikely to react well to other people telling us uh, what we have told the British. Uh, and I think the Congress likely to be elected tomorrow, even less enthusiastic about other people telling us to do more. Well, Heather, first it's good to see you. And, uh, and uh, we, we worked these issues a few years ago under other circumstances, and here we're working them again. Um, I, I think your point's a good one, but I, I think during the, the months that we worked uh, with the UK, I. I think what we both struggled with uh, at the highest levels as our ministers would talk and, and then at the lower levels as we would meet with our British counterparts and talk this through was, was how can we go about 
maintaining as much capability together as we could, going about it in, in a more creative way. You know, how can we do this smarter? Um, and, and, I, and I say that because I've spent hours around a table t with John Day, others in London, trying to figure out, because both of us have been in this, this business a long time, and trying to figure out how can we go about doing reductions and, and fixing problems that we know have been legacy problems from the Cold War that are in the forces, that are using monies that could be used elsewhere. How can we go about changing those and what is it that the UK should really focus on? What, should it, what is it that the US should really focus on in trying to get a, a picture of, of, of when we operate together, how do we want to do that and what do we want each to bring to the game? How can we go about arranging our forces so that we're as um, efficient? It's, it was really all about efficiency. Um, but, but again, it also goes back to this idea of, of the NATO context, um, because it's not, as I said, it's not just the UK, it's other NATO uh, capitals as well making these, uh, making these reductions and having to face the same issue, how can we keep our capability intact by going about what we spend our money on in a smarter way? How can we operate together in a, in a smarter way? I, you know, it's hard to believe that we ever had the luxury a number of years ago of having more money, and I guess, I guess there you can. Yes, well, this year, yes, that, well, we, we do indeed. But others, but others, others don't. And I think what's happened is that um, we there's been, there has been this real understanding that uh, we were able to get away with things 10, 15 years ago in terms of how we spent our money and how we shaped our forces that we can't get a, get away with anymore. That we've got to make those changes. And so it goes back to this opportunity point. Um, if we can do this in a coordinated fashion with the alliance, then I then then there won't be as much uh, responsibility uh, left to the United States or burden of, for the United States to carry. Obviously, we don't want to carry increasingly uh, an unfair burden, and that's always been something at NATO. We've we've worked on for years. All a number of us in this room have worked on the burden sharing aspect, and that's something that we have have worked hard and uh, to, to to try to keep things as level as we could. We're continuing to do that. Uh, but I tell you, if we cannot do this at NATO in a coordinated fashion, then, I'm, then, then, then there might be a, a problem in terms of that burden sharing. And, you know, I look on it almost like a potluck dinner. You know, you can't just let people bring what they want to bring based on their pocketbooks. There's got to be someone with a sign-up list saying, you're going to bring us out and you're going to bring, so that we can have something that makes sense when we need it. Mm -hmm. And frankly, NATO is going to have to come in, I think, after Lisbon and try to sort out where we are. Uh, in the alliance in terms of capability as we go through all these reviews. Jim, on that one, could I just raise one point that, that has been a little bit controversial, I think, in, and particularly in the British debate on this and the great uncertainty about the future of the British surface Navy force. Um, clearly, uh, the, the decisions of the SDSR made some very specific uh, choices about the notion that maybe long term, uh, lack of access to bases, uh, the need for carriers, but carriers capable of conducting a full range of combat operations, not so much on focused on literal. In fact, to cashier the current ocean and, and some of the other carriers that are more designed for, uh, you know, literal operations and kind of, you know, limited interventions. Um, what do you see as, uh, or in, in the discussions, if you can get into it uh, in, in, with the British government, uh, have you discussed this notion of how we look at, at uh, particularly if we had to do some kind of high, you know, intermediate uh, options? Uh, we heard General Houghton talk a little bit about they're certainly planning for one major uh, non-combatant evacuation, other kinds of um, humanitarian missions. But uh, what kind of capabilities do you think, and, and is there a way to harmonize this in terms of what the U.S. Navy is doing? Well, I am, um, you know, when I was in London, I didn't, I stuck to my, my beat, which was the geopolitical aspect and the broad aspect of how we would operate together. So I did not get into the services because I knew they'd want to all us, <laughs> be in the room with me to make sure their interests were presented. But I, I will say that um, the U.S. Navy and the Royal Navy have been close for, for years, uh, and both on the, on that nuclear side as well as on the conventional side. And, and I know uh, they've had a long tradition of, of working together and, and ensuring that as trends went back and forth, uh, whether, whether it was you know from the sea or littoral operations or whatever it might be, littoral operations, whatever it might be, that uh, that they were working together and trying to make sure that that that, that they brought to the table capabilities, whether it was Desert Storm or or, or wherever it might be. Um, I know that uh, that that as the uh, Royal Navy went through its value for money study of the of the um, of the UK uh, nuclear uh, 
uh, program that there was a lot of good back and forth and, uh, and attempts to see where savings could be made down in, into the future. And so I'm sure on the surface side that was being done the same way. That's, that's the thing about the special relationship that people talk about and that I am the, I am the custodian of. And that is um, there is a tradition that we have had since at least World War II of this very close working together at the service level. That, that, that isn't seen unless you're, you're in that service and you're working. And I think we have a very good example right at the end of the table of how we go about doing this in small ways and in big ways too. And I think as, we, as uh, the UK goes through uh, the SDSR and begins to implement its findings and has its, another review in 2015, whether it's the Navy or it's the other services working fast jets or, or working the, the ground side, I think at the service level is where we're going to find a lot of these ways where we can operate together, where we can operate more efficiently, and where we can try to keep the capability as strong as it was even when we had uh, larger forces. Anyone else want to? No. Well, uh, as General Hutton said, this is, uh, this is in terms of the SDSR, this was the beginning of, of, a, of a longer, much longer process and, and even maybe more contentious one that, that the UK will have to go through. Uh, you've heard a number of our panelists suggest that maybe uh, also the UK has been a bit of a mine canary uh, for what the US military may have to go through in the coming years. Uh, we certainly hope to, be, to continue to be engaged in, in part of that debate. And uh, in beginning, uh, as, as we mentioned on Friday, there'll be a, a yet another forum a Friday morning at 9 at CSIS and B1 Conference Center on the trends and analysis in both uh, European defense spending and defense industry. Uh, but we're also continuing to do some work on, uh, on this whole question of, of how uh, our, the United States and its key allies manage in an era of austerity uh, to maintain uh, defense capabilities effective to deal with a range of likely contingencies. So uh, we look forward to continuing uh, to, and hope you'll be able to join us for some of those discussions. I want to thank all of our panelists for joining us this afternoon and, and thank again General Houghton for getting us off to, uh, to a good start and, and again the, uh, another phase in a dialogue uh, uh, within the special relationship about the future of, uh, of our defense cooperation. So thank you all very much for joining us. Thank you.